Hello, everyone. My name is Sean Hoban. I work at the Morton Arboretum near Chicago in the United States. And today I'll be giving a lecture that was originally scheduled for the Botanical Society of Scotland at the Royal Botanic Garden of Edinburgh for March, uh, which was canceled. Uh, and so now we'll be giving this lecture online. In the lecture, we'll, you'll find my contact information in case you have any questions. I hope that you enjoy this presentation. Let me just share my screen. Okay, now we'll begin. I'll be talking to you today about the conservation of genetic diversity in botanic gardens, specifically focusing on trees. My contact information is there in the lower left if you would like to get a hold of me. The background for this talk is the uh, biodiversity crisis that the world faces today. One in five of every plant species are threatened with extinction. Already, millions of populations and their unique adaptations and genetic diversity have disappeared. And only a small fraction of species geographic ranges are protected in C2 or X2. And the crisis uh, will only become more uh, challenging in the coming years due to a number of factors, including the continued introduction of devastating pests and pathogens, conversion of our most biodiverse and carbon-rich ecosystems, such as tropical forests, and the ongoing climate crisis that the world faces. In this context, my lab group seeks to develop knowledge that can have conservation impact. There are four areas that we work on. We assess the status and threats of species in the wild. We try to understand how species will respond to ongoing climate change. We also try to translate our data and observations into conservation policy at local, regional, and global levels, including the global strategy for plant conservation. And we try to improve how botanic gardens and other ex situ repositories can conserve species and their diversity. And that's what I'll be focusing on today. What is ex situ conservation? It simply means conservation that takes place outside of a species natural range. It can often be necessary because of in situ threats, such as poaching, climate change, unstable habitat or invasive species that may threaten a species with extinction. Here, shown here are just a few examples of ex situ conservation. In the top left, uh, and then going clockwise, we see um, tissue culture, cryopreservation or ultra cold freezing, seed banks, and living collections in botanic gardens. Why are botanic gardens striving to conserve biodiversity? Well, I show here the mission statements of several botanic gardens. And you can see in these mission statements that conservation of biodiversity, specifically for the benefit of people and the planet, is core to our mission. Why conserve genetic diversity? Well, genetic diversity is the, um, is the key to species adaptations and evolutionary potential. It's also important if we want to use species uh, for human benefits, and it's known that thousands of plant species have been used by humans. Genetic diversity is also known to, especially for species like trees, to contribute to the stability of ecosystems. And genetic diversity is protected under different endangered species laws and global uh, biodiversity conventions. These are the things um, that I'm going to tell you about over the next 30 minutes or so. I'm going to show 
that we can use genetic data to quantify how much genetic diversity is in our botanic garden collections. I'm going to show you that often our current efforts are not enough uh, to conserve species for the long term. I'm going to show you some different ways that we can improve our effectiveness of our botanic garden work, including general rules um, and guidelines for future practice. And I'll talk a little bit about some future work, including key questions that need to be answered to improve our effectiveness. I hope at the end of the talk, you'll see that we can generate best practice advice and coordinate among botanic gardens to achieve the mission that I just outlined of conserving biodiversity for people and the planet in botanic gardens. Now, people have been working on this challenge of conserving genetic diversity ex situ for a long time. One of the first papers came out in 1975, uh, shown here. This was agricultural research scientists trying to conserve the uh, biodiversity that had been created through uh, crop breeding over thousands of years of, of human history, but which was disappearing as the food system became more homogenized and industrialized. So they wanted to conserve the many adaptations um, that had been developed for crop species and their wild relatives. They determined a simple rule that sampling from 50 plants in a population should capture most of the genetic diversity of that population. This general rule was applied to seed collections for the next four decades and has proven very useful to get genetic diversity. When I started reading this literature, I then thought, well, the simple model, this, this simple guideline was applied equally to all species. But we know that species exhibit a huge variety of traits and adaptations, such as seed dispersal, pollination mechanism, size and longevity, and geographic range distribution and habitat uh, specificity. These different characteristics may mean that different sample sizes and different conservation methods may be helpful for conserving different species genetic diversity. And that's where my work picks up. The first project I'll tell you about is um, a recently completed project uh, led by Dr. Patrick Griffith of the Montgomery Botanical Center and myself, funded by the Institute of Museum and Library Services in the US. We investigated how much genetic diversity has been conserved in botanic gardens of 11 taxa across five genera. To determine how genetic diversity is conserved in botanic gardens, we do a number of things. First, we go out into the wild populations, shown in the upper left, and we get leaf tissue from as many plants in the wild as possible. Then we do the same thing in our botanic gardens. Uh, to try and get as much of the ex situ um, plants as possible. We do some laboratory work, uh, DNA sequencing. We visualize that and analyze it computationally. Basically, we're comparing the genetic diversity in gardens to the total genetic diversity that exists in the wild. How much of that have we conserved? So I'll gloss over uh, a lot of the field details, uh, a lot of planning, a lot of field work, uh, and a lot of analysis goes into the results that I'm gonna show you, but I'll jump right to the results. Shown here are the number of plants conserved in botanic gardens. Of these 11 taxa, you can see it there's a big range from about 15 to over 200. This is an important illustration um, even without looking at genetic diversity directly, we can probably guess that there's very different amounts of genetic diversity conserved among these species. And that's what we see here. This is the fraction of genetic diversity conserved from zero to one. Now the global strategy for plant conservation states that at least 70% of a species genetic diversity should be conserved ex situ. We see that most of our species are meeting that goal. However, geneticists might recommend a more stringent um, threshold 
for getting most of a species genetic diversity being 90 to 95%. And in this case, we see that only a few of the taxa that we examined are meeting this more higher threshold. Now, if we plot those data that I just showed you, number of plants, and genetic diversity, in a simple plot shown here, number of plants being the x-axis and genetic diversity, the y-axis, we see there's a strong relationship between the number of trees and genetic diversity conserved. The clear message is that to get more genetic diversity in our botanic gardens, we need more trees in our collections. Now these samples I showed you are the collective efforts of dozens, uh, of, in some cases up to 30 botanic gardens. We need to, across the, the botanic garden community, get more trees into our collections. How many? Our work suggests that for many rare plant species, 100 to 200 plants should do a pretty good job of conserving most of the species genetic diversity. However, some species are going to need more plants in the botanic garden collections. Those with certain traits, such as larger geographic ranges, more habitat types they occur in, more fragmented ranges, and low dispersal ability means that more plants will need to be kept in botanic gardens. Some characteristics mean that we'll actually have to do repeated collections over a number of years to get all the genetic diversity. And this is shown here with another recent case study that we worked on. Um, another species that we looked at, it's much more widespread, still rare, and quite uh, specific to a, a very interesting habitat. This is a, an oak species that occurs in sandy habitats in the western United States. We plot here the number of plants and the genetic diversity conserved, and we see that its genetic diversity is much below that curve that I just showed you for the very rare plant species. So this spe these species that are widespread are going to need more uh, than that simple guideline of, of 100 to 200 plants. So a recap, what have I talked about so far? The genetic diversity conserved in the 11 taxa that we've looked at range from 40 to 95 percent. These species have had a lot of work done on them, both conservation work and science work, and so we expect that this to be an optimistic situation. Most plant species in botanic gardens are probably lower than the amount shown here. Most plant species probably need uh, about a couple hundred plants across the botanic garden community to get their genetic diversity. In some situations, we'll have to increase that amount. So we do have a lot of work to do as botanic gardens. Now, so what I just showed you was we can get more genetic diversity by getting more trees into our collections, and in some cases, tailoring our collection to the species traits. We also can work on um, better practices for when we're in the field collecting seeds. So this is myself doing uh, some seed collecting of that Quercus havardii, uh, desert oak. And you can see in the background that we're collecting along a roadside. This reflects that many seed collections um, are difficult um, for access reasons. Um, that seed collectors often go to places that are easy to access um, logistically and um, without um, permitting or, or legal issues. Uh, places where we know there's been seed in the past and places that are familiar, as well as places that are botanically interesting and beautiful. So what's the consequence of this? Um, the consequence is that some species are conserved better than others. So we see two examples here. One of these species falls above that curve and one below. They both capture about the same amount of genetic diversity, but that QB species, by the way, each of the species is color-coded by genus, so their genus and species is the, the letters shown here. So these two Quercus species, about the same amount of genetic diversity conserved, but one with many more samples than the other. 
Now, uh, what's the cause of this? Well, probably it's because collectors haven't been able to visit all the wild populations. And within populations, they may not have visited enough maternal trees to get the seed from. So we compared the amount of genetic diversity currently conserved to what could be done if we followed the best practice guidelines of visiting all the wild populations and getting as many maternal trees as possible. We could get up to 94% of the genetic diversity conserved, really getting close uh, or exceeding that threshold of the um, genetic recommendations for a robust conservation collection without actually changing the size of the collection. So if we had done the collection over uh, following the um, best practice advice, if it's achievable, sometimes some populations aren't producing seed, uh, some trees are difficult to access. So um, in practical terms, we might not be able to achieve that, but there is room for improvement. And this is what my colleagues and I have called the genetic conservation gap there can be a large increase in the amount of genetic diversity, on average about 40% across the species that we looked at, which is a really big conservation impact. When we're often trying to improve things by just a few percent. So that's a really big conservation impact. Now what I wanna do um, is move scales a little bit. So we haven't just worked on rare species. I'm gonna talk about a common species that some of you are probably familiar with, Praxinus excelsior. European ash. As you probably know, this species is threatened by a uh, fungal pathogen. As a part of the UK native tree seed project led by Q uh, Gardens and the Millennium Seed Bank, uh, a huge number of seed have been collected across the UK range of Praxinus excelsior. We estimate that for this very common species, we've conserved about 90% Q has conserved about 90% of the genetic diversity of the species. At this point, um, I was reflecting on how well um, the seed collectors have done, and I wanted to think about maybe are there any general practical rules um, that could be used for the future? Now, if you think back to that curve I showed you a few slides ago, we can uh, flip back to there. The accumulation of genetic diversity is this diminishing returns curve, always for rare species, common species. At some point, this curve starts to flatten and you've gotten most of the genetic diversity. So we wanted to look at what is the, what I call an optimal stopping point um, for when we're not getting much more genetic diversity per unit effort. For this species, we estimated that at about 30 populations and within populations, 30 trees. Uh, and as much seed is, as is needed uh, from those trees for restoration or experimentation or whatever the use would be. And this is fairly close uh, to the guidelines in the tree seed project uh, manual. Although it, it suggests a slightly lower, lower number, about 15 trees per population. So, so our advice might be to, when possible, collect from more maternal trees per population. Another practical um, rule that we looked at in this project is what I call genetic equivalencies. The main point here is that often one is limited by two things, uh, logistics and time in the field, or space and expense within the seed bank or garden. So we can trade off among these two uh, expenses. Um, and actually we can uh, identify strategies that will get the same genetic conservation goal, but have different allocation of effort. So these two strategies, one has fewer populations, so less expense in the field, but more total trees in the collection. So thus more expense in size in the seed bank or garden. Uh, the other has many more populations, much more expense in the field, but would result in a smaller um, seed bank required. So depending on the constraints of the organization, we can identify the best strategy for conserving the species. A final practical tool I want to talk about is when we have no information at all about the species genetic diversity. For this species actually we do have some genetic data, but um, we can pretend for a few moments that we 
only know about its geographic distribution, can we use geography as a substitute for genetic diversity? So shown here is the species geographic range. Each point shown is a known occurrence of the species. The white points are where it's been observed and the black points are where a seed has actually been collected from. The colors show the different, what are called ecoregions. So different types of habitat that the species might occur in. We can see here that the black points only cover a fraction of the species range and a fraction of these unique ecoregions, in this case about a third of the you know, habitat adaptations um, or ecological um, trait variation might be con conserved ex situ. This geographic method only requires known um, geographic points in situ and ex situ and can therefore be applied quickly and cheaply to many species. So this is a nice um, shortcut perhaps uh, yet to be verified if it correlates to genetic diversity. But this is a nice method that might be useful to apply to many plant species. So to recap the uh, second part of the talk, I showed you that we can improve our field collections um, specifically by visiting as many populations as possible. So more plant collections and plant exploration is needed by botanic gardens. We can determine rules of thumb that help to uh, allocate effort um, in the field, um, sort of making our collections more efficient as well as effective. And we can uh, explore um, tools that might not involve genetic data that can be applied to many plant species. Now I'll start to talk about some future directions. And the first future directions um, really regards a decision that, are, or a couple of decisions be made by botanic garden uh, curators and planners. There are two things I want to talk about. The first is what kind of genetic diversity are we trying to conserve? Some types of genetic diversity are harder to conserve than others. So specifically really rare genetic variants called alleles <clears throat> are more difficult to capture in a conservation collection because they're rare. They take a lot more effort to uh, collect. The other thing I want to mention is that everything I've told you so far assumes that we're collecting one of each genetic variant that exists in the wild, or a minimum of one. But disasters happen, fires, floods, hurricanes, pests and diseases, and we lose botanic garden collections all the time to disasters, but also to just tree age, death, uh, failure, failure to establish uh, or, or other damage. Um, there's actually a lot of turnover in our collections. And so we do need to back up a certain number of times, two times, three times, five times, whatever we collect in case it's lost. I'm gonna show you the minimum sample size required depending on how much duplication we want and the type of genetic diversity. So duplication is the rows and the columns is the um, more difficult to capture genetic diversity. So these are the sample sizes. Everything within a box is the range uh, from the first part of this talk, the, biologic, the biology, the traits, uh, the species geographic range characteristics is within a, a box. Among boxes um, is the amount due to the philosophy of conservation, what kind of genetic diversity and how much we need to back it up. So we go from two to four times to 40 to 50 times. Uh, you can see that the huge amount uh, contributing to this table is, is actually the decisions we make about what we need to conserve. So these questions about what we're protecting um, and how much of it we need have a huge effect on the necessary amount of plants in our botanic gardens. And this is gonna take research to, uh, into um, disaster risk and the usefulness of rare genetic variants, as well as conversations um, among curators and scientists. Another next step is uh, coordination. So to get these really large numbers of hundreds, or even in some cases, more than th a thousand plants uh, to conserve a species, we need communication and coordination among gardens. To illustrate this shown here are some of the 
uh, Quercus of the United States. We have 90 Quercus species in the United States, shown here are about 30 of them. You can see that uh, the y-axis is number of plants. So some plant species, some Quercus species are conserved much better than others. Some Quercus only have a handful, five, 10 or less plants across the Botanic Garden Network. So looking at this, we need to coordinate among gardens to prioritize which plants species are being added to Botanic Gardens to ensure that all species uh, are conserved, uh, hopefully in equal amounts. This will require sharing data among gardens as well as some gardens stepping up to um, plant large numbers of a few species in what we might call conservation groves to achieve high amounts of genetic diversity in a few gardens. As we start to think about these conservation groves or large collections in botanic gardens, I've also started to think about how many of our gardens are actually useful for conservation action, such as restoration, producing seed that can be used. To meet this criteria, collections would need to have individuals of reproductive age with uh, preferably non-related individuals of the same species nearby so that the seed produced would not be inbred and ideally from multiple locations so we can uh, make crosses both within and among populations to preserve local adaptations but also maybe try out new combinations of genes among populations that might be needed to deal with environmental change. So these numbers I show here in Botanic Gardens today only a subset of those numbers probably meet these criteria. So we need to make sure that our gardens are meeting these criteria if we say that a species is conserved. The final future direction is we need to start thinking beyond genetic diversity. Well, of course, the gardens already do this, but my work, uh, I'd like to start thinking about how genetic diversity within species trades off against other um, needs or goals, missions of a botanic garden including taxonomic or phylogenetic diversity, ecological diversity, um, different traits, adaptations, uh, the extremes of species and in, in genera, the most endangered species like I just showed you, and also horticultural varieties um, that have been developed um, that showcase really unique traits or um, adaptations. Currently at the Morton Arboretum, we're looking at these four dimensions and genetic diversity and how they trade off among four different uh, genera, each that have been added to the Morton Arboretum with slightly different goals over time. So we're working on that now, and in a year or two, we'll have uh, some answers for this project. To close the talk, I just want to thank the many people who've participated, advised, and encouraged me over the years, uh, including my PhD advisor, uh, Dr. Dean Romero Severson in the bottom left there, my lab group, and the many colleagues I've worked with in different places. The many people who funded my work over the past few years. And again, to remind you what I told you today. I showed you that uh, among rare plant species that we've done a lot of work on, we've conserved somewhere in the range of 40 to 95% of species genetic diversity. So for some species, we have quite a bit of work to do. We can conserve more diversity in the same amount of space by doing more optimal field collections. We can also identify strategies that help trade off against the different needs or uh, constraints, logistical or space, et cetera, of a different gardens. And lastly, uh, the, the um, number of plants we need to keep in gardens is dependent on, to some degree, on our conservation goals and priorities. So we do need discussions and research along, upon that for the future. And again, to emphasize, to achieve these large number of, of plants, to get the genetic diversity within species, we do need coordination among botanic gardens. So again, a thank you to the many colleagues who've worked with me over the years, some of whom I'm sure I've forgotten to mention or, or show pictures of. Uh, thank you to you for listening to this and hoping that we can continue to do this kind of work uh, to conserve species, their diversity, and ultimately benefit people uh, and the planet. So again, there's my contact information. And again, thank you very much for listening.